All right, so now we're going to move into the respiratory system, which of course includes the lungs and all the passageway to the lungs. So that would be your nose, the pharynx, the trachea, and so forth. So we've got the process of respiration. We've got two types of respiration. We have external respiration, which is the process of getting air, oxygen from the air outside into the body. And we have internal respiration. And internal respiration comes about as a result of cellular respiration. And this is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the cell. And it comes about because of our mitochondria, which are using oxygen in order to produce ATP. And so they're going to consume the oxygen and generate carbon dioxide as waste. And that will have to be exchanged back out to the circulatory system, taken to the lungs, and then let off into the air. So we know that one of the main purposes of the lungs is to provide an exchange surface for the diffusion of oxygen that you're bringing in from the outside and carbon dioxide that's being brought to the lungs in order to off-gas into the atmosphere. All right, so let's look at some of the other functions of the respiratory system. Obviously, the first is an ex uh, a gas exchange surface. And this gas exchange surface is about 35 times the surface of your skin. So it's, it's pretty extensive. So we're going to obviously have to move air to and from the exchange surfaces of the lungs. So we're going to have the conducting portion of the respiratory system, which we'll talk about in just a bit. We also have to protect the respiratory surfaces because what we have in the outside environment, if I look around out here, there's dust, there's pollen, there's bacteria, other things, viruses, all kinds of things we don't want. So we have an extensive system within the respiratory system that protects us from or protects the very delicate surfaces within the lungs from damage. Another thing that a lot of people don't think about at first is to produce sounds because we have to regulate the air coming in and out that will vibrate our vocal folds and our vocal cords and that will produce speech as well as singing and other sounds. And we also have it involved in the olfactory sense because it's what's going to bring air across the epithelial surfaces of the nose. All right, so we've got really two major divisions. We've got the upper respiratory system, and that's everything above the larynx. So that's your nose, your throat, up to the laryngopharynx, to the larynx, and everything below the pharynx or uh, below the larynx, which would include your trachea, your bronchioles, and the lungs themselves. All right, so the respiratory tract has a conducting portion. And this is going to be the part that leads the air into the lungs. No exchange of air is going to happen in the conducting portion. But then we're going to have the respiratory portion. And this is going to be where we have the exchange of air across the surfaces. So we're going to have mainly alveoli, which are these sac-like things within the lungs, these little pockets that contain very thin simple squamous epithelium that's fused pretty much with the basement membrane of surrounding capillaries so that there could be a very quick exchange of air across there. But we will see that we also have some some respiratory bronchioles that lead up to the alveoli and we can have some exchange of air there as well. All right, so here we have sort of a diagram, an overview of the respiratory system. Here we have our Nasal area, we've got our nose and our nasal cavity. There are going to be some sinuses surrounding this. Like here we have some sinuses here. We've got the frontal sinus. We've got uh, maxillary sinuses, sphenoid sinus, and so forth. These are going to help warm the air. Then we've got the nasal cavity itself. And we're going to take in air through the nares of the nose. And the nares of the nose will have hairs, near hairs, to protect the, these entrances from things like dust and insects and those kinds of things. Then within, within the nasal cavity, we're going to have these little turbinate things. These are also called nasal conchi. We have three of them, superior, middle, and inferior. And they're going to be very important because their whole purpose is to cause turbulence in the air. So when we bring it in, when we breathe it in, it doesn't go straight to our lungs. We want first to warm it. We want to humidify it. And we also want to swirl it around in here to give the olfactory epithelium a chance to be able to detect odorants. So we have turbulence through here that's going to allow for the air to be conditioned before we bring it into the lungs. Because cold, dry air is not good for the lungs. It would dry out the surfaces of the lungs very quickly, and that would be bad. So we want to be able to moisten it and humidify it and to warm it up almost to body temperature before it gets in there. 
All right, so then we have our nasopharynx, and then we're going to get into our oropharynx and our laryngopharynx. And one of the things that we're going to notice, and we'll talk about this later in the chapter, but we're going to notice that the epithelial surfaces of these will differ depending on where we are. In the, naso, in the nasal cavity in the nasopharynx, it's going to be a stratified, pseudostratified columnar epithelium that's ciliated. And we'll see that again in the trachea on down into the larger bronchi. And we will see that we will transition into a stratified squamous epithelium in the oro and laryngopharynx because we're also going to have the movement of foods and things through here. So we have to have some protection from abrasion and even chemical irritants. So once we get back into the trachea here, we're going to have pseudostratified columnar epithelium that is ciliated. When we go into the smaller conducting passageways, we will find that this epithelium changes to a cuboidal, a simple cuboidal, and then we'll, we're going to get into, when we get into the alveoli themselves, we are going to find that it's going to be simple squamous. All right, so here we have our trachea, which is the main conducting pathway. Then the trachea is going to branch off into primary bronchi. We're going to have a left and a right bronchus. So we're going to have the right bronchus. It's going to be a little wider in diameter, and it's going to be a little bit steeper, whereas the left bronchus has to accommodate the fact that the left lung is on the same side of where the heart is. And we have this little cardiac notch here that's going to accommodate the heart. We'll also notice that the left lung is going to be a little bit longer, but more slender than the right lung. The right lung will be shorter and fatter. And that's because we're going to have the diaphragm on the right side is going to be a little bit higher up because the liver, the main part of the liver, is going to be on the right side. So the left lung can extend a little bit farther down, but the left lung, of course, has to be slender to accommodate the fact that we have the heart on the left side. All right, so the respiratory epithelium is what we find within the alveoli. So it is very thin. We're talking about one, one micrometer here. And so the surface area is about 35 times the surface area of the body, so it's quite large. Now, this is what gets destroyed in things like COPD. And this is also what becomes affected when you have things like uh, chronic smoking problems and things like that. So these walls are very, very thin, and they're basement membrane. The basement membrane of the simple squamous epithelium is going to be fused directly to the basement membrane of the endothelium within the capillaries that are going to supply these, these alveoli, and that's going to allow for a very rapid exchange of gases. All right, so the respiratory mucosa, as we know, has an epithelial layer, and then, of course, we have our areolar layer underneath called the lamina propria, and that's going to bring us our blood vessels, lymphatics, and so forth. So we're going to have the conducting portion of the respiratory epithelium that most of it is going to be that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and we're going to have a lamina propria underneath it. Now, once we get into the the exchange surfaces, we're not going to have a lamina appropriate. We're just going to have a basement membrane fused directly from that simple squamous epithelium of the alveolus to the endothelium lining the capillaries. All right, so the lamina appropria, we know what it does, just like in other areas. It's a real or connective tissue. It's going to support the overlying epithelium. Epithelium. It's going to contain lots of mucous glands that are going to secrete onto the epithelial surface. And when we get into the lower respiratory system, we're going to have a lot of smooth muscle in there. We'll see as we're in the upper part of the respiratory tract and conducting passageway, we'll see we'll have a lot of cartilages that are going to shape the tract and keep it open. But once we get into the lower portions, we're going to have that replaced by smooth muscle. All right, so here, if we look in the trachea, we're going to see pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So here we see our ciliated columnar epithelium. We're looking at the cilia. And these things are going to be sweeping dust and particles and mucus and all of that up to the surface so we can cough it out. So here we've got our cells. So we've got our pseudostratified columnar cells. So we've got some of our basal or stem cells here that aren't 
They don't have an apical surface at the top, but they look layered even though every single cell is in contact with the basement membrane. So here are some of our columnar cells. Here's some goblet cells. Here's our cilia. Here we've got some mucus that's being excreted. Remember, we've got mucins in here, and when they combine with water, they form mucus. So we have this mucus coat, and that's going to trap things like dust and bacteria and debris and smoke and this sort of thing so that we can cough it out. And this is called the mucus elevator because we're constantly moving this stuff up. And we either could swallow it where the pathogens will be destroyed probably by stomach acid, or we can cough it out. And in some individuals who have cystic fibrosis, they make way too much of this and it's too thick. And they can't move it on the mucus elevator. So it tends to get stuck and they tend to be have problems with infections or respiratory infections. They're very susceptible to that. And they have difficulty breathing. And they can cause mucus plugs that pl cl clog up some of the conducting pathways. So people with cystic fibrosis usually only live to be about in their mid-30s, typically, in the U.S. All right. So as we've said, we've got lots of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells within the from the, the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. And then we switch back to that stratified squamous epithelium until we get back to the to the larynx and the trachea. Really down in the trachea is where we switch. And we've got our back to our pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. All right. So basically, w once we get down into the smaller bronchioles, then we're going to get to a cuboidal epithelium. And we'll have a little bit of uh, scattered cilia, cilia in here, too. All right, so when we get to the alveolar epithelium, as we said, it's simple squamous. We've got several specialized cells in here. We actually have two types of what we call pneumocytes. We've got type 1 pneumocytes, which are these really thin, simple squamous epithelial cells, which allow for the exchange of gases across epithelial surfaces. And we have type 2. And those are going to create something called surfactants. And surfactants are this slicky, watery material that basically prevents these things, these walls, from collapsing and sticking together. So it prevents the alveoli from collapsing. And then we're going to have a third type of cell uh, called um, phagocytic dust cells. They're also called alveolar macrophages. And these are macrophages that patrol around inside the alveoli looking for pathogens that may have escaped from our conducting portion down into the respiratory portion. All right, so that brings us to our respiratory defense system. We've got lots of filtration me mechanisms to get rid of pathogens and particles. We've got mucus cells and mucus glands that run most of the conducting portion. Cilia, they're sweeping that trapped debris and mucus towards the pharynx and the mucus escalator so we can cough it out. And we also have filtration in the navel cavity itself because what we have in the navel navel nasal nasal cavity because <laughs> because we can cough out a lot of stuff and we've got hairs even in the nose nose hairs near hairs that will get rid of things like insects that fly oh look at that lizard that is really cool anyway so we've got we've got insects and dust and other things that can get in there all right so as we've said by the time we get into the the respiratory portion, most of our pathogens and debris have been filtered out. Anything that escapes filtration from the conducting passageways is usually picked up by the alveolar macrophages. that are also sometimes called phagocytic dust cells. All right, so the nose. The air enters via the external nares into the nasal vestibule. And then we've got nasal hairs that are going to be the first of our filtration system. All right, within the nasal cavity, we have the nasal septum. That divides the cavity into left and right halves. And this is made by the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, if you recall, and the vomer. Remember the vomer, where they come together right in that nasal cavity. And the superior part, we're going to have the olfactory region. This, remember, is the bottom of our cribriform plate. And remember, our olfactory nerve goes up through those perforations in the cribriform plate. So we've got some of our olfactory epithelium that's on the superior portion of the nasal cavity. And then we're going to have all kinds of mucus secretions from the paranasal sinuses. And we've got tears. Remember, we've got the lacrimal glands and the lacrimal ducts that are draining into the nasal cavity. And that's also going to help clear out the, the uh, nasal cavity. All right, so we've got airflow that's going to go through these internal nares, and these are through what we call superior and in, in, 
middle and inferior meatuses, which are passageways, and these are created by these turbinates, also called nasal conchi. And these, the purpose of these, these meatuses, are basically going to allow for air to circulate through the nasal cavity before it's brought into the lungs. That allows it to get warmed up close to body temperature, humidified so that we're not breathing in extremely dry air, and we can also trap particles. We probably all experience what it's like to go out and run on a very cold winter day, and if you're breathing through your mouth, then it hurts the lungs because you've got this cold, dry air coming in there, and that's not conducive to, it's not good for the lung tissues, for the alveolar tissues. All right, we also have the hard palate, which you remember is that floor of the nasal cavity, and that's going to be um, created by the palatine process of the maxilla as well as the palatine bones. And then we have our soft palate, which extends posterior to the hard palate, and that's going to basically divide the nasopharynx from the oro and laryngopharynx. All right, so air flows are going to go through the nasopharynx, through, or I should say, uh, go into the nasopharynx by the internal nares. And so, of course, as we've said, the nasal mucosa, one of the things that it does is going to warm and humidify this air that's coming in before it reaches the lungs. And so this is why breathing through the mouth can make your lungs hurt and make you feel kind of tight in the chest, because basically you're bringing in very cold, dry air. All right, so if we have a closer look, here we have our hard palate here. Here we have our soft palate. These are our internal nares here. These are our turbinates, also called nasal conchi. We have a superior, middle, and inferior, and we also have superior, uh, middle, and inferior meatuses that are created by these things. So we're going to have our external nares here and then our internal nares which are going to be on the inside. They're going to lead into the nasopharynx. From there we have the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, and here we have our trachea. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And we've got our larynx here which is going to divide, remember our lower respiratory system starts at the larynx. So everything above this is the upper respiratory system. Everything below this is the lower respiratory system. And we're going to talk about several cartilages here a bit in the larynx that are really quite important. And we'll see that the larynx is not only important for breathing, but it's also important for speaking and this sort of thing. All right, so the pharynx, before we get to the pharynx, uh, the larynx, we go first to the pharynx, which is basically the throat. And so as we've said, we've got the nasopharynx, which is behind the nasal cavity. This is still lined with that pseudostratified columnar epithelium. We've got the oropharynx, which is behind the mouth, and the laryngopharynx, which is behind the larynx. These are going to revert back to that stratified squamous epithelium for protection from foods and abrasive things, and as well as from, from uh, chemicals, you know, acids, whatever. But by the time we get to the laryngopharynx, um, once we transition into the trachea, we're going to transition back to that stratified or pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium. All right, the nasopharynx, we already talked about that. Um, we also are going to have our pharyngeal tonsils up there, and we're going to have, remember, our auditory tubes, our eustachian tubes. These are going to empty into that um, nasopharynx. So as we know, the oropharynx is behind the oral cavity. The laryngopharynx is the bottom part or the inferior force portion of the pharynx, and it's going to extend from that hyoid bone to the entrance of the larynx and the esophagus. All right, so from the pharynx, it's going to enter the larynx through a little opening called the glottis, and we've seen this, and by now you've probably already seen it um, when we studied the organ systems. And we have a little piece of elastic cartilage that closes over the glottis called the epiglottis. And that prevents things like food and water or liquids from getting into the larynx and into the trachea. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the cartilage of the larynx. We have the thyroid cartilage, and thyroid literally means shield shape. So this is the large cartilage. And that's the one that sticks out and the one that gives you your, you can feel it. And on guys, it gives them the Adam's apple. Then we have the cricoid cartilage, which just means ring shape. It's right below that. Both of these are hyaline cartilage. The thyroid sits on either side of the cricoid cartilage. And remember, thyroid just means shield shaped. So anything that's shield shaped is called thyroid. 
And then we have the epiglottis, which is the elastic cartilage, and that's going to close over the glottis when we swallow. All right, so the thyroid cartilage, as we've said, this is our uh, going to pro provide that large shield-shaped cartilage in the larynx, and we're going to have lots of attachments, hyoid bone, epiglottis, laryngeal cartilages. So the cricoid cartilage is right below it. It's the C-shaped, or it literally means ring-shaped. And it's going to be just posterior to the, or I should say inferior to, not posterior, but inferior, unless you're in a cat, of course, is going to be inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And it's going to communicate with several cartilages that we'll talk about that are internal. There are three that we'll talk about. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to make you memorize them or anything, but we'll, we'll touch on them because we'll see them. And one of them is the retinoid cartilages, which means ladle shaped. Then we've got the epiglottis that's going to close over the glottis, as we know, when we swallow. And as you've probably seen in the model that we have in lab, the ligaments are going to attach the thyroid, uh, ligaments attached to the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. All right, so the thyroid and cricoid cartilages are basically going to support the throat and keep it open, or I should say support the larynx and keep it open. So the glottis is the opening to the trachea. And that's going to be where the air comes in. And then we're going to have, when we swallow, the larynx itself is going to rise up a little bit. And that's going to cause the epiglottis to fold back over the glottis and close it so that we don't inadvertently take in um, food, particles, or liquids. All right. So we've got some smaller hyaline cartilages. We've got the retinoid cartilage, the corniculate cartilages, and cuneiform cartilages. The retinoid means ladle-shaped, corniculate, horn-shaped. And cuneiform is wedge-shaped. And we're not even going to be able to see these in the, the illustrations. We're going to be able to see them when we look down. And there's a picture that's taken with a laryngoscope that when we look down through the vocal folds, we'll be able to see it. All right, so here is our shield-shaped cartilage. This is our thyroid cartilage. Here is our cricoid cartilage right here. And then we're going to have our thyroid thyrohyoid ligament. I'm not going to get make you memorize all this. Here's our hyoid bone. Here's our epiglottis. Remember, this is an elastic cartilage. Both of these are going to be hyaline cartilages. And all these little tracheal cartilages are also hyaline cartilage. And if you remember looking on the cat, it looks like a shot vac hose. You've got these big rings that hold open this thing so that the airway does not collapse. All right, if we look inside, here's our arytenoid cartilage here. Um, and this is basically the ladle-shaped cartilage. The corniculate horn-shaped cartilage is here, and there's one on either side. And then we'll see a picture, as I say, when we look down into the throat, we will actually get to see the um, cuneiform cartilage. So let's see if I can find it over here. Well, we'll see it pretty soon. All right, we're also going to have some vestibular ligaments, vo vocal ligaments. And so all of these things are going to be important for the production of sound as well as opening and closing of the glottis, which isn't just important for keeping food out of the, the, the conducting passageways, but is important for the production of sound. All right, we've got vestibular ligaments, which are going to lie within vestibular folds, which are going to protect the vocal folds. We'll see this once again when we see, when we look down into the throat with a laryngoscope. And sound production will happen when air passes through the, the glottis and vibrates the vocal folds, just like vibrating strings on a musical instrument. All right, so we can vary the tension in our vocal folds. We can make them taut, which will make the pitch of our voice higher, or we can really relax them and make our voice go lower. So it's going to, this is going to be controlled by some of the voluntary muscles. Then this is going to change the position of the retinoid cartilages relative to the thyroid cartilage. So let's say I'm not going to get too much into the details of that, but obviously this is very important. And this is why sometimes people who are respiratory therapists will worry about obviously breathing. But we also have speech therapists, which will train people how to coordinate the action of these these things you know if somebody suffered a stroke or something like that because not only is it important for speaking but it's also important for swallowing properly now speech is got two two major components to it we've got phonation which is just sound production in the larynx larynx and then we have articulation and that is like 
using your tongue and your teeth to produce sounds like consonants. And so ah is just a vowel, and it's just from air coming up out of the glottis and vibrating vocal folds there, or I should say through the glottis and vibrating the vocal folds. But in order to get intelligible speech, you have to have consonants, and you have to modulate the, the type of vowels that you're producing as well. All right, so here's looking down into it. Here's our vocal folds here, um, or I should say our vocal cord. Uh, these are our vocal col folds. And then the space when they open is called the rima glottidis, which I can't say very well. Looking down, we've got our corniculate cartilage and our cuneiform cartilage. Now you can see where the wedge-shaped cartilage is kind of embedded in this structure here. And underneath that, we would have the retinoid cartilage. You can't really see them here. They're underneath here. Um, here's our vestibular fold and our vocal fold. This is really basically the same thing as the vocal cords. The vocal cords are contained within it. Here's our epiglottis sticking up, so it's sticking up towards you, kind of like the petals on a flower, and when you swallow it will close over this. All right, here it is for real. Here you can see sort of the top of the uh, corniculate and cuneiform cartilage. Um, here we have a there's a vocal nodule right here, so somebody's harmed their vocal cords. So basically we have the vestibular fold on either side of it, and the vocal cords are here, and the vocal fold with the vocal cord. And so this is basically what we're looking at when we look down into somebody's throat. So this is the rima glottidis right here. And that's basically the anatomy that we see inside if we're looking down through the glottis. And of course, this becomes important when you intubate people. You want to make sure you get them in the trachea and you have to get past the vocal folds and not get the esophagus because that's not going to do you any good. All right, so we've got several muscles of the neck and pharynx uh, that are going to control. We've got some intrinsic muscle that are going to control the vocal folds and open and close the glottis. That's going to be important for swallowing and speech production. All right, now we can move on into the trachea. The trachea is colloquially known as the windpipe. And this is the part that when you intubate someone, you intubate into the top portion of the trachea. So this is going to extend from that cricoid cartilage down into the mediastinum, and then it's going to branch into left and right pulmonary, pulmonary bronchi. And these are what we call our primary bronchi. And these things here are going to be important. There's going to be a little notch right where they separate called the carina. And all of these are going to be supported and kept open by tracheal cartilages. But as we branch further and further, as we see they will, then the cartilaginous rings will become more like cartilag cartilaginous plates, and those will then give way to smooth muscle. Now, remember we've got our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium through most of the upper conducting part. I want to be specific here. We're talking about the lower respiratory system, but we're talking about the upper part of the conducting passageways. So as we get into the smaller, smaller bronchioles, we're going to start to see a transition into cuboidal epithelium. All right, the submucosa, that's beneath the mucosa, that's going to be beneath the epithelium and the lamina propria, we're going to have lots of mucus glands. All right, here is the trachea, and you can see this hyaline cartilage ring, and notice it's not complete. So this is our hyaline cartilage. If you look really closely on the slide, you can actually see the little chondrocytes in their lacunae. Um, you see that it's not complete. And that allows for some expansion and contraction. We've got the tracheolus muscle that behind it, and it basically is going to link the two ends of the cartilaginous, the incomplete C-shape. So our tracheal cartilage, cartilages are like this, and we're going to have the, the tracheolus muscle behind it. Behind that, or I should say between it, behind that we're going to have the esophagus. And this will help when we swallow something through the esophagus, obviously the esophagus is going to expand as the bolus goes through it, and that's going to put some, you know, you're going to have to have some give within this uh, lumen of the trachea. And so that's going to be accommodated by the fact that the C is not entirely closed. But by the same token, the C is going to prevent, the C-shaped cartilages are going to prevent the closing of the, of the trachea. All right. So our 
respiratory epithelium here are going to be, as we've said before, our pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. That's going to bring the mucus up the mucus elevator either to be swallowed or coughed out. All right, so we've got about 15 to 20 tracheal cartilages. And as we've said, we've got an elastic ligament that's going to interconnect the two edges of the C. And we're also going to have that tracheolus muscle. All right, we've got our left and right primary, primary bronchi separated by that carina, which we talked about earlier. We'll see a picture of it in just a minute. As we've talked about before, the right primary bronchus is going to be a little bit larger in diameter. And it's going to descend at a steeper angle. And this is why people tend to get uh, infections more often in the right bronchus than in the left. And also, if you're not careful when you intubate, you've got to be careful not to get so deep that you get into that right bronchus. Um, so it's... Um, remember, the right lung is going to be shorter and fatter. The left lung is going to be longer and thinner to accommodate the heart. And the right lung is going to be a little shorter to accommodate the liver on the right side. All right, so here it is. Here is our trachea. Here is our right bronchus. These are primary bronchi. So here's our right bronchus. Here's our left bronchus. Then we're going to have secondary bronchi. And these are going to go to the lobes of the lungs. And we will see that the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two lobes. So the left lung has two secondary bronchi and the right lung has three secondary bronchi. And then these will then branch off into what we call segmental bronchi, which we'll see in just a minute. So these bronchi are going to enter at the hilum. And as we've seen with other organs and other structure, structures like the lymph node and the kidney, the hilum is where a lot of things come into it or out of it. So it's usually a little notch, and this is where things will come in. So we're going to have our pulmonary nerves, blood vessels, lymphatics, and our bronchi are going to enter into this hilum. And we're going to have a meshwork of connective tissues that are going to hold everything in place there. So basically the root of the lung is going to be this connective tissue along with the nerves and vessels in the hilum. And this is going to be anchored to the mediastinum, which as you recall is that center part of the thoracic cavity behind the sternum. All right, so the lungs as we know are contained within their pleural cavities. Their bases are right on top of the diaphragm and their apex or the part that's projecting superiorly. It's the curved part that projects just above the first, the first rib. All right, so we're going to find that we have fissures separating the lobes of the lung. So in the right lung, we're going to have a horizontal fissure and an oblique fissure. In the left lung, we're just going to have an oblique fissure. So the right lung has a superior, middle, and inferior lobe, and the left lung is going to have just a superior and inferior. So if we look at that, here it is. Here is our right lung. Here we have our superior, middle, and inferior lobe. Here's our oblique fissure. Here's our horizontal fissure. In our right lung, or sorry, our left lung, we have our superior and inferior lobe separated simply by this oblique fissure. We're going to have the cardiac notch here in the left lung. Notice it's going to be a little bit longer and thinner. This one's going to be a little bit shorter and fatter. And if we look on the medial surfaces, we will see the hilum here. This is where we have the entrance of the bronchus, our pulmonary arteries and veins. And this is where we're going to have lymphatics and nerves enter in as well. All right, so now we're looking at a transverse section. So here is our posterior aspect, our anterior aspect. Here's our sternum. Here's our heart. Here are our lungs, our right lung and our left lung. So obviously immediately you can see we're looking from the feet up um, instead of top down. So the patient is going to be it becomes very important when you start to read things in section that you can orient whether you're looking from the feet up or from the head down. In this case, we're looking from the feet up. So this is our right lung. This is our left lung. And here's our heart. All right. So you can see here, here's the oblique fissure. And let's see if we can see a little bit over here. We see some bronchi coming in here. Um, let's see. Esophagus is here. And here is our aorta. And then we have got our spinal cord right here. Here's our vertebral body. Here's our spinous process, transverse processes, and so forth. All right, now let's get down to the bronchi as they branch, they form the bronchial tree. 
because the primary bronchi will branch into secondary bronchi, branching into tertiary bronchi, and so forth. And the extrapulmonary bronchi, as the name implies, are the bronchi that are outside the lungs. So this is going to be the left and right primary bronchi, the portions that are outside the lungs. The intrapulmonary bronchi are all the branches that are inside. So each branch is going to, each primary branch, bronchus is going to form secondary bronchi. These are also called, called lobar bronchi because one goes to each lobe. So on the right, we're going to have three secondary bronchi, and on the left, we're going to have two secondary bronchi. These will then branch off to form what we call tertiary bronchi that are segmental bronchi. And each one of these is going to supply air to a single bronchopulmonary segment. Now we have in the right lung, we have 10 segmental bronchi, and we have 8 to 9 in the left lung. In development, they start off being 10, but then they fuse, and you end up with 8 or 9 by the time you have a fully developed lung. All right, so we have, as we've already said, we're going to have less and less cartilage as we get smaller and smaller with our bronchi as they continue to branch. They start off as cartilaginous rings in the trachea and the primary bronchi, and then in the secondary bronchi, then they start to start by the tertiary bronchi. We're going to start to see little cartilaginous plates, and then they're going to give way entirely to smooth muscles. Now, you can have an inflammation of the bronchial walls, and this is often called bronchitis. Obviously, it's going to cause some constriction and difficulty in breathing. All right, the bronchioles are really small branches. These are going to be where tertiary bronchi basically are going to branch into multiple bronchioles. And the bronchioles will then branch into terminal bronchioles. And these are where we can start to see some exchange surfaces happening. So by the time we get to the bronchioles, they've got no cartilage at all. They've got smooth muscle. And remember our autonomic nervous system. This is going to control the diameter of the bronchioles. So our sympathetic nervous system is going to open them up. Our parasympathetic division is going to close them up. And so a lot of times the bronchodilation is going to happen. It's going to be the dilation of the, these bronchioles, and that's going to be caused by sympathetic nervous activation. And that's going to reduce resistance to airflow. That's going to allow us to bring more air into the lungs. Now, when people have asthma, they have a lot of constriction of these passageways. So this is by too much parasympathetic stimulation or histamine release. So allergic reactions can also cause constriction of these bronchi and or these bronchioles. And asthma, obviously, is excessive stimulation of bronchoconstriction, and this is why they have sudden bouts where they can't breathe. All right. So when we get into the pulmonary lobules, now we're talking about the lung tissue itself, we're, we can see that they are partitioned by trabeculi. Remember, trabecula means beam. So these are basically fibrous connective partitions that are going to come out from the root of the lungs. And these are going to support the, the lymphatic vessels and blood vessels and so forth. They're branching repeatedly and they're going to divide the lobes into increasingly smaller compartments. So our little primary, primary, can't talk today, our pulmonary lobules will be divided by smaller and smaller trabeculi and these are called interlobular septa. All right, so here's some pictures of the lungs. Here we see our trachea, our primary bronchus on the right side, primary bronchus on the left side. We've got our secondary bronchi on the right lung. We've got three of them going to each lobe, two in the left lung here. And then we've got our tertiary bronchi here that are branching off. And these are basically going to be supplying bronchopulmonary segments. And so we've got 10 in the right lung, eight to nine in the left lung. All right, now we can look at sort of the change in the passageways from the trachea and the primary bronchi. And as we start to get smaller and smaller and branch more and more, our cartilaginous rings start to give way to these cartilaginous plates. So that by the time we're in the tertiary bronchi, we're covered into these, by these plates that are not, they don't really wrap around anymore. They're just sort of studying the surface. 
By the time we get down to our bronchioles, we've switched to smooth muscle. Then by the time we get to our terminary bronchioles, we're leading into the respiratory bronchioles. So now we're giving away completely to epithelial surfaces. So we're not going to have smooth muscle or anything around the respiratory bronchioles because we can actually start to have some exchange of gases across here. And we also are going to have our alveoli come off of here. So we have alveoli that are coming off our pulmonary lobule. So, or I should say our respiratory bronchial within a pulmonary lobule. And all this is going to be taking place, we're going to have a bronchopulmonary segment that's going to have these alveoli in pulmonary lobules within them. All right. So each terminal bronchial is going to deliver air to a single pulmonary lobule. And we've got pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins that are going to be supplying this lobule. And each terminal bronchial is going to branch to form what we call our respiratory bronchioles. This is where gas exchange is going to start to take place. This is where we're going to see the alveoli branch off. And these alveoli are like these sac-like structures, look like grapes, clusters of grapes. All right, so we have the alveolar ducts, which are going to con basically connect the alveoli with the respiratory bronchioles. And these ducts are going to end at these alveolar sacs, from which all these little blebs, these alveoli, are going to bleb off of it. So this is where we're going to have sort of a common chamber, which is like a bigger, I think that was lightning, which is like a bigger, it's where a bunch of alveoli just basically level off of it. Okay, so I guess that's my cue to go inside. All right, well anyway, each alveolus then is going to have an extensive network of capillaries and is going to be surrounded by our elastic fibers because as you can imagine, the alveolus is where the gas exchange is going to take place and therefore the alveolus then is going to have to have a very extensive supply of capillaries because where's the oxygen going to go? Of course into the capillaries and the capillaries will be bringing the carbon dioxide that came from respiratory, um, I should say internal respiration or cellular respiration is bringing it to the lungs to be off-gassed to the environment which is part of our external respiration. All right here's a picture of it. Here we have our smooth muscle around a terminal bronchiole. Here we have an alveolus. These are all little alveoli. Here we can look inside. We can see the alveolar sac, which is basically going to be where all the little alveoli bleb off of it or branch off of it. And an alveolar duct is what's going to terminate in this alveolar sac. Here we have the alveolar duct terminating into this alveolar sac with all these little alveoli coming off of it. Each one of these is an alveolus. You can see these little elastic fibers going around it. And then, of course, we can see our capillary beds surrounding each alveolus and here we have a branch of the pulmonary vein and here we have an arteriole coming in we've got some lymphatic vessels all right so here's what it looks like in a scanning electron micrograph so you can see the little individual alveoli here's an alveolar sac and an alveolar duct that's going to end in an alveolar sac that's then going to be surrounded by all these little alveoli all right, so as we said before, we've got a simple squamous epithelium that lines this, the inside of an alveolus, or yeah, an alveolus. And we've got this type 1 pneumocytes, and these are going to be the actual exchange surfaces. And we're going to have our alveolar macrophages, which are also called phagocytic dust cells. And we're going to have type 2 pneumocytes that are going to produce a surfactant. And as we said, surfactant is this, this substance that basically prevents the collapse of the alveoli because it keeps the alveolar walls from sticking together. If you don't produce surfactants or if you have a problem with type 2 pneumocytes then the alveoli will collapse and it's very hard to open them back up again. So if you're not producing surfactants then the pressure just because of the uh, alveolar wall sticking together it takes a lot more air pressure to open up those alveoli so it's harder to inhale. All right, so surfactant, as we've said, is a sort of oily secretion. It's got phospholipids and some proteins in it, and that's going to reduce the surface tension, and that's going to keep these alveoli open. And here's a picture. Here we see our 
simple squamous epithelium here. Here is our type 2 pneumocyte here. This is type 1 pneumocyte, which is our simple squamous epithelium. And here is an alveolar dust cell, a phagocytic dust cell, an alveolar macrophage. And they're going to be patrolling around in here. Now look here. We have this endothelium of a capillary. And the basement membrane basically is going to be fused between these epithelial cells of the alveoli and the endothelium of the capillary. Everywhere else, we're going to have a little bit of some elastic fibers, of course, because remember the lung is going to expand and contract. So we're going to have to have some elasticity within the lungs. All right, so whenever we have a respiratory distress syndrome, this is when we have some kind of difficulty in respiration due to alveolar collapse. And this is, as we said before, when the type 2 pneumocytes don't produce enough surfactant. So as we said, the respiratory membrane, that's where the alveolar gas exchange takes place. All right, so we've already talked about a little bit about the layers of the respiratory membrane. We have the simple squamous epithelial cells lining the alveolus, and then the endothelial cells lining an adjacent capillary, and their basement membranes will be fused between them. So that means that the gas has a very little distance to travel to get from one to the other. So here's a picture of it. Here we have our fused basement membranes. Here is our alveolar epithelium, so our type 1 pneumocyte here. Remember, the whole thing's covered with surfactant that was made by those type 2 pneumocytes. That's so going to keep these walls from collapsing. We're going to have on this side, we've got our endothelium, which is also a simple squamous epithelium. But when it's inside of blood vessels, we call it an endothelium. So here's our capillary endothelium. And here's our capillary lumen, and here's our blood cell. And it's going to be bringing oxygen, and then we're going to be picking up our carbon dioxide, um, or sorry, the other way around, typically. We're going to be bringing up oxygen from this side, and the red blood cell is going to pick it up. And then we're going to have our exchange of carbon dioxide. Most of it's going to be as carbonic acid bicarbonate, and it's going to come come this way and it's going to basically be converted back into water and carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide will will diffuse this way more on that a little bit later in the chapter all right so as we know the diffusion across the re without a respiratory membrane is going to be quite rapid because the distance is short and if you were to have an inflammation of the lobules, this will be called pneumonia. This is when you have fluid leak into the alveoli. And of course, as you can imagine, that's going to impede any kind of gas exchange in there and is going to prevent the respiratory membrane from doing its job. All right, so very quickly, let's look at the blood supply to the lungs. And we're actually going to be receiving on the respiratory exchange surfaces, we're going to be getting some blood from the arteries of the pulmonary circuit. And each alveolus is going to be surrounded by a capillary network, and that's going to be part of the respiratory membrane because, as we know, those type 1 pneumocytes are going to be fused to the basement membranes of those our, um, endothelial cells. We're going to have some blood from the alveolar capillaries basically pass through the pulmonary venules and veins and return to the left atrium. I'm not going to get too much into the blood supply of the lung. Suffice it to say, this is as far as we're going to get into it. But what we will get into is we're going to talk much more about the exchange of gases across the epithelial surfaces and what happens to it after that. So we're going to have capillaries that are going to be supplied by the bronchial arteries, and these are going to provide oxygen and nutrients to the tissues of the conducting passageways. And then we're going to have venous blood that bypasses the systemic circuit is going to flow into the pulmonary veins. All right, so one thing that's important to know is the pulmonary circuit blood pressure is quite low. It's only 30 millimeters of mercury as compared to 120. So these pulmonary vessels can get blocked by anything, blood clots, fat, even pulmonary emboli that are air bubbles. So air bubbles can block this, and that can cause a pulmonary embolism, which can basically shut down blood supply to the lungs, and it can kill you. So that would be bad. All right, so we know that the lungs are contained within the pleural membranes. 
We know about this. We know about the visceral layer that's flush with the lung. We know about the parietal layer, which faces the external surface. And we know that we have the serous fluid inside, an inflammation of the serous fluid, where you get too much serous fluid and you get an inflammation then of the pleural membranes because you get too much fluid in the cavities. That is called pleurisy. And we know the two pleural cavities are basically that have or surround the lungs are separated by the mediastinum and we know that each pleural cavity obviously has one lung in it. So we've already talked about the two layers, the parietal pleura, which is on the outside, the visceral pleura, which is on the inside, and of course the pleural fluid, which is a serous fluid, which separates the two layers. And remember, obviously, what that does. We talked about it ad infinitum when we talked about the peritoneum. It allows the layers to slide over one another. And so that means the lungs can expand and contract without friction. And this is why pleurisy is bad, because if you get something that in impedes that, well then you can't inflate your lungs fully. So people who sometimes have pleurisy will have a very hard time breathing. All right, so we'll stop there and in the next segment we're going to pick up on internal and external respiration. We're going to go over those processes in a lot more detail and we'll talk about cellular respiration and how we need the uptake of oxygen and carbon dioxide within individual cells and how internal respiration is going to, to provide that need. And external respiration, which is going to involve the process of exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide with the environment.